Well, we have hit the top of the hour, and I'm going to invite us to uh, gather your drinks, and let's um, come back, and we'll get seated. Um, but as you get seated, we're going to actually have some invitation here from Haley, who's going to lead us in a little embody practice. Since we just ate food, we've been sitting in thoughts and wrestling, so we're going to do some body getting in, back into our bodies, right? Yeah. Do you want this mic, or do you want the one on? I can take this. Or this. Oh, yeah. I, I will take this one. Yes, yes, I will want to stand. Hello, everyone. Oh. Hi. Um, so I'm going to invite us, like Sarah said, to some embodiment practice and a state of gratitude as well. So if you are willing and able, I'm going to invite you all to stand and make some room around you. I mean, you're not going to be hitting your neighbor per se, um, but just to give your body some space to breathe, right? We've digested a lot intellectually as well as food, which should we give a round of applause to Houndstooth? Thank you for lunch today. Absolutely delicious. <laughs> Lovely. Okay, so as we are entering into a state of gratitude, I'm going to first invite you to just start gently rolling your shoulders in a circular motion. Doesn't have to necessarily be forward or backwards, you can choose. And I want you to envision two paintbrushes extending from your shoulders. So you're going to be making a smooth circular motion with your shoulders. Notice how tension is leaving your body. Make sure you're continuing to breathe, right? Sometimes we forget to breathe in this process. So go ahead and switch directions if you have not already. Continuing to imagine those paintbrushes extending from your shoulders. That is up to you, Elgin. All up to you. Multicolored paints are welcome here. Um, so now I'm going to invite you to think of those paint brushes and extend them with your hands. So what you're going to be doing is you'll be making a circular motion with your hands now, envisioning, I mean, Elgin, if you want to have them in a T position, fine. Um, I'm imagining them more down towards your maybe um, thigh area, um, so that we're almost making a circular motion of having this painted circle around our feet. And if you can, try and rotate from your midsection rather than from your shoulder area. Continue to breathe throughout that process. We're stimulating the colon, getting some digestion flow in here as well. Love it, love it. All right, I'm going to invite you to come to stillness and actually you can be seated for this part. So thank you for participating in the standing part. And I invite you to ground both of your feet into the ground. So all four corners of your feet should have some surface on the ground below you, okay? And next, I'm going to invite you, if you are willing and able, to close your eyes. So for this part, we're going to enter into a state of gratitude for our bodies in particular. So I first am going to start with our sense of taste. So I want to invite you to thank your taste buds, their ability to know good food when they encounter it, Thank your eyes for the beautiful display of colors and textures that appeared before you just moments ago. In addition to the lovely faces that you gathered around. For your ears that took in the sounds of the laughter and conversation made by those faces that you encountered. And at the cellular level, your body's ability to convert the food that you just ate into a source of energy that fuels you, allows your body to move about the day, and to provide your brain the mental clarity and nutrients necessary to engage in reflection and critical thinking. I invite you to savor this feeling of gratitude as we will now enter into a state of prayer. Thank you. 
I invite you to take a deep breath in, connecting with the spirit, connecting with those moments of noticing that felt especially meaningful as well as challenging for you this morning. How can those challenging moments become meaningful moments of action and transformation? And as you take another deep breath in, and then exhaling, what you need to release. What are some of those old beliefs and patterns that are no longer serving you, that are no longer serving the church? What is it that we need to release from our minds, our thoughts, and our bodies to become more open, available, and action-oriented in the way that Jesus is calling us? Our opening scripture for this afternoon is Psalm 34, verses 1 through 9. And this is from Will Gaffney's translation. I will bless she who is God at all times. Her praise shall ever be in my mouth. I will glory in she who is strength. Let the humble hear and rejoice. Proclaim with me the greatness of she who is exalted and let us exalt her name together. I sought she who saves, and she answered me and delivered me out of all my terror. Look upon her and be radiant, and let not your faces be ashamed. I called in my affliction, and she who hears heard me and saved me from all my troubles. The messenger of she who saves encompasses those who rever her, and she will deliver them. Taste and see, she who is delight is good. Happy are those who trust in her. Rever she who is God, you that are her saints. For those who rever her lack nothing. Hi. So this morning we talked about the church, and now we're going to talk about you. Um, I actually think we've been uh, talking about you, about us, all along, but this is going to get personal. This is about each of us and our life together, and this is about the community of faith, communities of faith, really, the concentric circles of community that move outward and outward and outward all around the world. And as you and I both know, and as we've talked about, life in community can be awkward. You are the church, even those of you who wonder whether you belong in it. You are the church, and you belong. Even those of you who have been told otherwise by a human who was speaking out of turn in a voice that was far more authoritative than it deserved to sound. You belong, because you were called to the church by someone a tender and merciful and gracious someone whose love brought you into being and whose love was expressed in solidarity for you and whose love defines your belonging still. You are the church and no other creature has the right to tell you otherwise. So occasionally I'll see a post on social media, usually a negative one, that says something along the lines of, well, the church did this to me or the church did that to me, or the church inflicted this on me. And I always pause, because my reaction is always the same. Well, yes and no. 
Because yes, these things might have happened under the guise of an institution, but it's a human institution, and the key word there is human. When we say that the church did something or didn't do something, when we claim that the church was responsible for something or refused to accept responsibility for something, the truth is that a human or a group of humans operating under the auspices and the name of this institution did or didn't do something. The church is not a faceless monolith. The church has bodies. It can be as fallible and as fickle as all humans are. So this afternoon, we're going to spend some time wrestling with what it means to be human. We're going to do that individually and together. And because I'm a writer, I'm going to inflict on you a couple more brief writing exercises. These two are for you, and they are about you. So I encourage you again to be as honest and candid as you have the courage to be. Uh, you're going to need two slips of paper. Uh, you can tear just a corner of your notebook out. Sorry to those of you who like perfect, unblemished notebooks. <laughs> um, the first question you are going to be sending up to the front, your answers to the first question, but your names are not on them unless you want them to be, unless you want me to let everybody know your answer. So as I said, be as honest as you can. And again, you're going to have just one minute. And this question is going to be familiar uh, to you. And maybe when you finish, you can just put them, fold them in half, put them at the center of the table, and then one person from each table can bring them up to this green bin that I have on this chair here so we don't have a mass movement. One minute to answer the question, what do you personally need to repent of? No pressure. <laughs> kind of like what we did about the church, but this one is about you. What do you need to repent of? One minute. That's why I'm only giving you a minute. OK, fold those up. Send them with your messengers up to the front to be spirited away forever and ever. And as those are being brought to the front, I want to start you thinking about your second piece of paper. And this will sound familiar, too. Who do you hope to be in the world? Who do you hope to be in the world? There are so many ways to answer this question, right? It could be nouns. It could be adjectives. It could be words or phrases, entire sentences. I guess it could be profanity. <laughs> but then please come see me afterwards, and let's have a little chat. Because either you are super good at using profanity in ways that I don't know, or we have other issues. So who do you hope to be in the world? And you're going to have one minute to answer the, that question. And hang on to that one. One minute.
Okay. That's a minute. So this morning, I told you a snippet of my story, just the barest bones about my journey um, out of the church and then back again. And some of you might have felt as if that journey was boomerang-shaped, except that's really too neat and tidy. My spiritual experience has been more wave-like, uh, with peaks and valleys, and honestly, maybe more valleys than peaks. And perhaps those of you who have never left church will be able to relate to this as well. Even those times when I have technically been in the church, a graph of those seasons would show that there were deep troughs. Because life in community is hard, and because people are annoying. And when I say that people are annoying, I include myself in that. Sometimes I am super annoying to myself as well as to others. You know what, before I continue, I think this would be a good moment to read aloud um, some of the things that you want to repent of. So let's see what surprises we have in store. Being so rigid and inflexible, anger and impatience, being someone who tries to fix rather than appreciate, Pride, judgment, holding a grudge, scarcity mindsets, not liking myself, racist and sexist thoughts and comments, that wasn't a repentance, some of you didn't understand the assignment, but that's okay, <laughs> judgment, annoyance of neighbors, A friend moved away because of unkindness and bullying. Need to be more courageous. Need to be ready to be led by the spirit. Not going the extra mile for others. Self-righteousness and arrogance. A desire for fame and being the center of attention the desire to feel important, anger and impatience, laziness and impatience, all my bad habits. OK, that's kind of an umbrella. <laughs> Not listening. I had you send these up here, and I could keep reading, but I think, again, we're starting to see some patterns of things that are coming up. And I had you send them up here to symbolize that the bad things that you think you've done, even the worst things that you've done, they don't have eternal power over you. You aren't defined by them. You are defined by the belovedness that God has written onto you and into you. And you get the opportunity to keep sending your anger and your patience and your arrogance and your self-righteousness away, casting them away again and again. And I had you send these repentances up here as a symbol of your letting go of those negative thoughts and those sins against yourself and against others. And that is not to say, let me be clear, that is not to say that your work is done. Because perhaps in pondering what you need to repent of, you realize there's restorative work that needs to be done in relationship with someone else, someone who's been hurt by your anger, someone who's been harmed by your impatience, someone who's been on the other end of your refusal to listen. Perhaps in considering what you need to repent of, you might recognize that you owe someone or someone's an apology and you need to make amends. Perhaps in thinking about what you need to repent of, you might even map out some strategies to embody your repentance, because if repentance is not just saying sorry. Repentance is not just confession. Confession, even in the form that we've just participated in, it can be one small step toward repentance, but repentance requires turning back from that. If you want to read more about repentance, I commend to you Rabbi Danya Ruttenberg's recent book uh, on repentance and repair. 
she unpacks the ancient Hebrew concept of teshuva, which is translated in English as repentance, but in Hebrew, it's literally a return. Teshuvah is a beautiful image. In Hebrew, the word can be used for the return half of a round trip ticket, as well as for the spiritual sense of return. Return to wholeness, return to community, return to what we were made to be. If we believe that we were made for and in the spirit of love, teshuva then is the process of doing whatever we need to do to remove anything in the way of that full return trip to love. Repentance is teshuva. So in those seasons when I've been in a spiritual trough, often I have been halted. Honestly, I've often halted myself from returning to love. Sometimes it's because of a relational conflict, uh, either something I did to someone else or something someone else did to me, or even something I did to myself, hasn't been addressed, and it certainly hasn't been healed. Sometimes there's a misunderstanding. Often there's a misunderstanding. For instance, for a long time, I held things against God that God did not do. They had simply been done in God's name. But that messed up my entire relationship with the church because I was blaming God for things that were perpetrated by and responsibilities of human beings. So that's why we're delving this afternoon into who you are and who you hope to become. These questions are inextricably intertwined with the work that we did this morning about who you are as a church, who you are as a family of faith and whom we hope to become as communities of faith and as the church universal. So I want to actually ask some of you, who you whom you hope to become. Do I have any brave souls who are willing to share? Any irrepressible extroverts who just need to make their voices heard right now? Um, I would love to hear from three or four of you who are courageous enough to say in front of friends and strangers whom you hope to be in the world. We'll sit here as long as it takes. <laughs> We've got one here. <laughs> the, <clears throat> the, the hands and feet of Jesus. Thank you. Anyone else? Back there, next table. Open to listening to everyone else and being able to love or be God's expression of love when I fall short of loving them and myself. Thank you. Another one? Back there. Finding a way to um, share God's love as a mother and not just a pastor. Thank you. Do I have one introvert who has felt the prod of the Holy Spirit to speak? <laughs> one shy introvert. If there is even one, the Lord will not destroy Minneapolis. Um, I wrote, I hope to be all God created me to be without the fears my culture has imposed upon me, with all the love, courage, curiosity, hope, joy, faith, and communion with my creator and his remnant as possible. That's beautiful. Thank you. These hopes are for you. I want you to tuck them in your wallets, put them in your journals. Somewhere they'll be accessible to you to remind yourself, especially in that moments when you feel unmoored, who you hope to be. I would encourage you to return to this practice from time to time, because your hopes might change given what's going on in your life or in the world, but to actually write it down in pen and ink on paper so that you can remind yourself who you want to be, who God is calling you to be. 
I also want to return your attention to the hopes that were expressed on that quilt of sorts that we constructed this morning. I want you to consider your individual hopes and those collective ones together and see where they intersect, where they overlap. None of what you've expressed, both to me and to yourselves, will be possible. None of your individual hopes, none of your collective hopes, if you are just trying to get there with your human effort. If you're just trying to get this done yourself. We would not be here, honestly, if that were possible. None of this will be possible. None of the individual hopes or collective ones will come to fruition unless you remember that you are held and equipped and empowered by something much greater than you, which is God's love. If you remember one thing from all my blathering today, this is the one thing I want you to remember. And if you remember one thing from any sermon I've ever preached, this is the one thing I want you to remember. You are loved by a love beyond all other loves. It is a love that formed and shaped you before you could even breathe on your own. A love that has come alongside you in solidarity. And a love that will accompany you all the way to the end of days. You are loved. You are loved as you are, and you are loved as you are becoming. The entire good news rests on that truth, that you are loved. The entire work of the church rests on our ability to be motivi motivated by that truth, that you are loved. You know how every Martin Luther King Day politicians and social media posters from across the political spectrum, they trot out this line from Martin Luther King, that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. What people often don't get, because it's not memeable, is that Martin Luther King said and wrote and understood that this arc, it doesn't just bend on its own. It is bent by God, and it is bent by God's love, and it is bent by God's people who are empowered by God's love. All the good that you could do alone or together will fail unless it is undergirded by this truth that we are loved by God. Love is such a tricky thing, uh, sometimes to express, often to feel, usually to know deep in your bones. When I was an angsty teenager, I became an expert at the art of moping. It is not as easy as you might think because it requires this particular slouchy posture and a special arrangement of one's facial features such that your internal sense of boredom is adequately expressed on the outside. <laughs> Mere melancholy, which I referred to this morning, it can be and often is private, but this brand of mopiness that I'm talking about is public and performative. If I had wanted to keep my mood to myself, I could have taken to my bed in like dramatic 19th century fashion. But my teenage mopiness, uh, it demanded attention. It was meant to provoke a response, even if that response would inevitably dissatisfy me. So my mopiness was embodied in a dramatic flop onto the family room sofa, accompanied by sighs loud enough to be heard by my mother, who was inevitably doing something in the adjacent kitchen. And she would say, what's wrong? I'm bored, I would say. And what would follow was a predictable litany of suggestions, each of which was, of course, even more irritating than the one before, and each of which was a reminder to me that my mom didn't get it and couldn't get it. And even before this ridiculous dance began, I could tell you how it would end. Within minutes, my mother would be exasperated. And she would play the card that I knew she, being a devout Baptist, would play. Well, maybe you should just pray about it. You should talk to Jesus. And I would whine, well, Jesus won't come hang out with me. Just pray, she would say. And here's the thing. Looking back, she was sort of right. In her weird... Baptist way, she was trying to remind me that I wasn't alone, that God was always with me, even though I wasn't feeling it. 
because we want to feel loved. And that means we want to know deep within us that we are seen and that we are heard and that we matter. We want to know that we aren't just welcome. You all are great at welcome. We're actually wanted. We want love to enfold us in all these different ways. That's what I couldn't express as a teenager with those severe blockages between my heart and my brain and my mouth. We want love to be visible and we want love to be palpable and we want love to be evident in myriad ways. So how do we experience that? Because if we can't experience that, I don't know that we can fully express it either. I want to offer you five practical, actionable ways to experience love and let this day be written in history because I am notorious for offering zero actionable anythings in my talks. <laughs> I am practically allergic to clear takeaways, but for some reason, spirit has moved, so here you go. The first thing that you can do is to experience beauty. Every single one of you is capable of experiencing beauty, and it won't look the same to all of you. I can't tell you exactly what form beauty will take in your life. For me last Saturday, in the midst of an unseasonably warm stretch of April weather, and don't worry, even in Michigan it didn't last because it snowed and hailed last Monday, uh, the tulips in our front yard blossomed in a fury. I was shocked at how many yellow tulip bulbs, some streaked in orange, some with just a little black at the heart, I had bought, I didn't know I had bought so many yellow bulbs, oops. But there was one, just one, and this one was this color halfway between pink and purple. I don't know how to name it, I don't work at Benjamin Moore. <laughs> On the edges of its petals, there were these touches of green and yellow, and I experienced beauty. For me, many days, it's the sight of my old deaf dog, Fozzie, who you could see on Instagram if you like. Fozzie was snoozing on a blanket in my study. And when Fozzie came to live with us three years ago, things were kind of bleak. Uh, he'd been at a shelter in Indiana for more than six months. The lady at the shelter told us nobody had asked about him except for us. That might be because he was old and deaf, but also when he arrived at the shelter, he was covered in fleas and ticks. Both eyes and both ears were infected. All the fur on his butt had been scratched away. And he had an untreated thyroid condition, so half of his back and his whole tail were bald. They weren't sure he was going to make it. But if there's one thing about the Foz, it is that he is resilient. And slowly, with medicinal baths and a better diet, we've managed the infections. He's even grown, up, uh, grown back some of the hair on his bald butt. And I will look at Fozzie sleeping near my desk. And he'll be kicking his legs and grunting in the middle of a dream, and I tell myself he's chasing rabbits. And I experience beauty. For me, some days, I don't know what's come over me, because I'm being really candid with you, and now I'm going to talk about my questionable taste in pop culture. Some days I will spend an hour on YouTube watching the blind auditions on The Voice, or I'll put on HGTV and watch one of those home makeover shows, especially the ones they re where they redo the house of someone who's really had a hard life. And when those chairs spin around on the voice or when the person walks into their suddenly redone home for the first time and they start crying and then I start crying because I think about their sense of possibility and the glimmers of hope and then I experience beauty. And here's why I think it matters so much to experience beauty. And it echoes a little bit what Haley was doing with us. To be attentive to beauty is to cultivate our ability to feel wonder and awe, and to know that we have that power in our bodies. As the brilliant writer Cole Arthur Riley says in her book, This Here Flesh, to allow ourselves to be taken by the beauty of a thing allows goodness to take up the space it's often denied in our interior world. Awe, she adds, is a spiritual muscle of our humanity that we can only keep from atrophying if we exercise it habitually. Our ability to experience beauty, whether with our eyes or our ears, our fingers or our taste buds, in all the glory of nature or in the worst of reality TV, 
Our ability to find beauty is itself a sign of God's gracious love. It reminds us that we've been given through no work or effort of our own, through nothing that we could ever orchestrate, this extraordinary sensory system that enables us to take in information and process it and feel something. It tells us that we've been blessed with this phenomenal superpower, which is the power to perceive. The ability to experience beauty reminds us both that we are loved and that we are capable of loving. The second thing, cultivate gratitude. This is not new to you. Sometimes I think that Tristan, my husband, should really be the one who's up here talking in churches, except he detests public speaking even more than I do. Um, Tristan, throughout our marriage, has made me a far more compassionate and kind human. He instituted a practice that we do occasionally, not every single night, even though we probably should. Before we go to sleep, we tell each other three things that we're thankful for. And they can be the tiniest things or huge ones. You could even say, I'm thankful this day is over. But then you still have to come up with two more things. <laughs> and here's what that does. To express gratitude is to acknowledge love's presence in the world and in our lives. It might be easier to see the connection between gratitude and love if, say, that day you are thankful for the friend who reached out to say they were thinking of you, or because you got an unexpected bouquet of flowers. But here's the thing. Even if you're thankful for the McDonald's french fries that you ate, and we should all be thankful. They're really good french fries. You are thankful not just for those fries, but also for the potatoes, and also for the hands that grew those potatoes, and also for the hands that cut and fried them, and the hands that put them into that little paper bag. And you could say, well, Jeff, they were just doing their job. But you know what? Duty and diligence are often underappreciated forms of love. If you are thankful for morning bird song, are you not also expressing gratitude for the one who's one who made the birds and fed them? If you are thankful for a relatively easy commute, are you not also expressing gratitude for the ones who paved the roads and the ones who built the car and the ones who were careful enough not to slam into you because they chose not to text while driving? A consistent practice of cultivating gratitude is a wondrous way of recognizing love's presence all around you and your ability to love. Third, commit yourself, maybe once a week, maybe once a month, to a two-fold practice of reminding yourself that you are loved, and then reminding someone else that they are loved. So the first part of this, reminding yourself that you are loved, I don't mean just sit there and say, I'm loved. It might mean budgeting $3 or $5 a month to buy yourself one glorious stem of your favorite flower and putting that on your desk as a gesture of kindness to yourself. There's a place called the Flower Bar that just opened in September in Minneapolis. You can buy one stem of any flower. It might mean creating a playlist that you know touches your soul music that helps you be the best version of yourself. You could write yourself a post-it note, you are loved, and leave it on the bathroom mirror one night so that you'll see it the next morning. The most disciplined among you could even try something that I have never managed to do because it freaks me out, but someday I might like to. What would happen if you stood in front of that mirror and you regarded yourself and you said with all the conviction that you can muster, you are beautiful and you are loved. The second part of this, and this matters, it can be as simple as sending an email or a text message to someone who is dear to you for no other reason than to tell them that you're thinking of them. It could be bringing someone a meal or Venmoing them $5 so they can buy themselves a coffee. It could be carving out the time to sit and listen and let them be as annoying as you know they can be. A consistent practice of embodying love both to yourself and to others helps us recognize love's presence all around us. And it helps us to radiate it 
out into the world. A fourth way, begin a practice, especially in moments when you're not your best self, of asking yourself what you need in that moment. I took a class in seminary that really changed me. The professor taught us to see needs, and this is hard with you Minnesotans with your Protestant work ethics. <laughs> needs are not weaknesses. They're invitations. We all have needs. It's part of being human. And I believe that we were wired to have needs, needs that we cannot meet ourselves because we were created to be relational beings in relationship with God and one another and the earth. We were built for interdependence, never for independence. So in moments of stress, my professor invited us simply to ask, what do I need right now? What do I need right now? And then you give yourself that gift. And let me illustrate how this works because it sounds weird and woo-woo. So at my church when I was still living in New York, I was an elder for a year, which I really didn't want to do because I had enough meetings in my life. And then after a year, I was asked to chair the elder board, which I wanted to do even less. And I did that for two years. And in some ways, it was beautiful. That church helped make me the church geek that I am today. And in other ways, which most of you who have been on church committees know, it was terrible. And there was one guy in particular who my not best self would say God put there just to be a thorn in my ecclesiastical flesh. I was a relative newcomer to the congregation, and he reminded me that he had been there for more than 40 years. If I proposed something, it was near automatic that he would oppose it. If I said something, he would almost always be the first to say, well, actually. <laughs> and I realized after taking this class at seminary, what I needed and what I craved was respect. And I never actually did get any of it from him. And so in these meetings, I would jump right in. I would respond too hastily. I would try to earn my place. And I would try to prove to him my worth. And what my professor taught me was that in those moments, I could give to myself the respect that he never would give me. I could say to myself, I am. I am a beloved child of God, and I give myself the respect that I need right now. I belong on this church board, and I will not give power to him over me that he doesn't deserve. And I will not react impatiently to him. Instead, I will say the next thing only when I am rooted again in love. I will respect myself. Asking yourself what you need at any given moment might be answered in any number of ways. Uh, if you are feeling invisible, you might need to remind yourself that you are seen. If you are feeling unheard, you might need to feel heard. If you're feeling small or insignificant, you might need to be reminded somehow that you do matter. But that sense of seenness and heardness, that sense of mattering, the sense of respect that I craved, these things will always elude us if we wait for other humans, all of them as unreliable and fickle as we are ourselves, to offer it to us. So instead, we have to remember that we are loved by the God who made us. And nothing can take that love away. And all of those needs can be met by the God who knows us better than we know ourselves. Nothing can take that divine knowledge away. We are seen and we are heard by God. We matter to God. We are respected by God. And this practice reminds us that we are loved by God in the ways we need to be loved. I know some of you might feel like we should start preparing a charcuterie board because Jeff just got super cheesy. <laughs> I'm not going to apologize for this. You are loved. You are loved. And the church and all of us who have any claim to be in the church will never give our hopes their best chance of succeeding if our sense of belovedness is not better developed. Here's why all this matters so much. 
your sense of belovedness, your understanding of how much you matter to the one who made you and the one who sustains you, and your grasp of grace, that sheer, utter, ridiculous grace that underlies that love will help you remember that everyone else is beloved too. Everyone else matters to the one who made them and the one who sustains them. And that sheer, utter, ridiculous grace is for them too. The last actionable thing I have to offer is to remember your ancestors. And this one will also be weird for some of you. Remember your ancestors. The sense of being unloved, which is so deeply human, is also a sense of being isolated and alone. And like Mopey Jeff, you might cultivate that sense of isolation. But one of the worst lies that we tell ourselves is that we are alone. We are not alone. We are never alone. And I don't mean that to sound like a threat to my fellow introverts, especially those of you with young children and really just need to be alone. We are not alone. For one thing, we have the testimonies of our ancestors. And when Christian and I were planning this time together, I think I surprised him with the amount of scripture I wanted to use not just in Sunday worship, but also today. We've heard three passages of scripture so far, right? From Revelation, from Lamentations, and from Paul's letter to the Romans. No, the Psalm. I'm going to do Romans in a bit. Because these have traveled with God's people over the millennia. Faithful congregations of people much like you, looking around at the world, sometimes befuddled by it, sensing these gaping wounds, wanting to offer some healing, grasping for solutions, coming up, with little more than thoughts and prayers. Faithful congregations of people just like you have tried and tried and tried. And they've also leaned on these ancient stories and these ancient songs for solace and for strength. And I believe that scripture has been given to us as wisdom, yes, but also as a reminder that we are not the first to come this way. How many generations have found strength in the reminder that we believe in a God who answers and delivers us from our terror? How many generations have looked to God as the source of their radiance? How many generations have turned their faces to God and, and, and in the glow of divine love they have felt their shame melt away? How many generations have felt so weak, so at a loss, yet in the presence of God, in communal testimony, in congregational resilience, they have found a way forward. Remember your ancestors. Remember that they were very imperfect. And maybe they made some choices you wouldn't have made. But remember, too, that they tried to be faithful. And maybe you can offer them the same grace that you hope your descendants will offer you for your mistakes. I remember my grandfather and my grandmother the Baptist preacher and the Bible teacher, who no doubt would have had some theological differences with me if they were still alive. And still, I am so grateful for their faithful witness. I keep their photos in my house to tell me the story that I need to hear all over again, that I am not alone, that I carry them with me, including their tender strength and their faithful resilience. You might remember someone who mattered so much to you, who made you feel as if you could take on the world. You might remember the congregation that was daring enough to invite Howard Thurman to preach, as well as the congregation that was thoughtful enough about beauty to make a home for quilting together, and the congregation that was bold enough to walk through a difficult process of changing a name that represented so much, but that also might now be telling a story that isn't right anymore. Remember your ancestors, and it might remind you that you are not alone, that in all your human imperfection, but also your human beauty, you are loved. Hear Paul's words, written to an ancient congregation that was undoubtedly full, like yours is, of clashing personalities and people with diverse stories. What then are we to say? about these things. If God is for us, who is against us? He did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us. 
how will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ who died, or rather, who was raised, who is also at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than victorious through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. For I am convinced that neither the intolerance of people who are white don't realize and aren't open to grappling, nor the racism nor white saviorism, nor not listening, nor being afraid, nor not loving myself, nor being judgmental, nor impatience, nor judgment, nor self-righteousness, nor pride, nor self-centeredness, nor not praying enough. Nor not listening, nor hypocrisy, nor narrowing my view, nor anger, nor inflexibility, nor being someone who tries to fix rather than appreciate, nor pride, nor being right, nor holding a grudge, nor a scarcity mindset, nor not liking myself, nor sexist thoughts, nor answers that aren't answering the question, <laughs> nor unkindness, nor bullying, nor lacking courage, nor not being ready to be led by the Holy Spirit, nor not going the extra mile, nor arrogance, nor self-righteousness will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. New winds of the Spirit. I don't know about that. Maybe you just need to feel the breeze again, as if for the first time. Maybe you just need to feel the love of God again, because when we recognize our own belovedness, when we glimpse the divine in our own lives, we are freed and empowered to love others more expansively, too. New winds of the Spirit. Maybe the church just needs to be what it's always been called to be, which is the body of Christ embodying good news for the sake of a fractured world. And maybe you just need to remember who you've always been and who you will always be, which is God's beloved. You are loved, dear ones. You are loved. Amen. We've got about five minutes. If you have any questions, if, if you're like, no, Jeff, I'm really not loved, we can chat. Questions, concerns, comments? Jenny has a microphone. So, you know, my question is uh, relative from this morning. Um, how do we meet our neighbor's needs when we're really so busy doing tasks? There's many things that we uh, pride ourselves in doing that are great things that we're doing, yet um, how, how are we meeting the needs and maybe who are our neighbors? Um, how do we spread steadfast love from these walls? It doesn't all depend upon our senior pastors who 
and leaders who, who work so hard for us, but it's really all of us. So, you know, the letters of Paul, um, he, war he was warning, he was encouraging, he was sharing Christ, um, saying that Christ is living and he reconciles human beings to himself by his spirit. I don't think you have a question. <laughs> that wasn't a question. A comment, then. Yes, Let's a be comment. honest. If you're not going to ask a question, say it's a comment. <laughs> you had something you wanted to say to your church, and I affirm that. But it's not a question. You have ideas about how you think the folks in this room need to be showing up for other people. And you need to be bold enough to do that in an appropriate way, not tucking it into a question that's not a question. <laughs> Don't be sorry. Don't be sorry. Have the conversation with your friends and neighbors that you really want to have. And that's a conversation that's going to have to go on long before I get on a plane back to Grand Rapids. But I sense the passion and the heart there. And that's what I want to affirm, that you need to take that passion and the heart into those hard conversations that you need to have when I'm not here. And they're going to be uncomfortable conversations. And you might even disagree with each other about which neighbors you need to love most and when and how. But you need to have the conversations. So thank you for the comment. Let's do one more, and then I'm going to bring the panelists up. I have a friend who is on his way to the mission field, and he has revealed that he is really struggling with the feeling um, that he is not really able to hear from God. And um, he acknowledges that his father um, abandoned the family from his ages 9 to 20. He knows that that is a factor in his feelings. And yet he's heartbroken that and angry that he says, I, I have reached out to God and I've asked him to make himself real and I'm tired of asking. How do you help someone who's obviously yearning for more, but struggling so deeply with it? So it's interesting to me that, and I'm going to take for granted that you're quoting him accurately, right? So he's holding against God something that his father did to him. One of the reasons that we heard scripture read with different pronouns is that scripture uses different images of God so that we can glimpse different aspects of God. And one of my favorite images of God is where Jesus is looking over the city of Jerusalem. And scripture describes Jesus as having that love that's like a mother hen brooding over her chicks. And so if your friend had a better relationship with his mom, Maybe the tender strength of God was in her resilience after the father left. And maybe that can be a way to view God's love. And I don't know what your relationship with, you, with your friend is, but I also think of how Jesus related to his friends. And one of my favorite stories is how Jesus cooks breakfast for his friends on the beach after the resurrection. And maybe your friend can begin to see God through friends who come alongside him and share a table with him and listen to him so that we don't have this one-dimensional God who is defined by the worst relationship that we had in our lives. But we have a multifaceted God whose beauty we begin to glimpse through the beauty that surrounds us through all these different relationships that made us who we are. Does that make sense? Thanks for that question. Thanks for the opportunity to come alongside. I would love to bring Sarah and Gary and Rye back up here, and we are going to be joined by the Transcendence Felicia Nicole.
And we're going to talk a little more about us. I think I need to. There's always that dramatic moment on The Voice or American Idol when they pull the microphone out of the stand. I don't need that. We should have two. There's four stools. I will sit at your feet. No, I'm your student. So I have a confession at this very moment, and this is how event planning goes sometimes. I don't have my questions. Do you have them? <laughs> I did all this prep, and then I forgot. Awesome. That's so beautiful. Okay, thank you to Sarah. We are each other's salvation sometimes. Um, so one of the things that struck me when I was doing my prep calls with all of you is you all started in very different places, denominationally, theologically, churchily, than you are now in. And I always think there's something that we can all learn from each other's journeys. Um, I would love for each of you to tell us about maybe a significant turning point somewhere along the way uh, that helped bring you to the place you're now at. That's a signal from Gary that he doesn't want to go first. <laughs> I don't mind. For me, it was traveling to Southeast Asia and spending about two and a half weeks while also studying theology, studying, learning about what I thought I knew already. And so in the midst of kind of the crucible experience of seminary, which I deeply appreciate, also um, engaging people in a part of the world that is 95% Buddhist and being confronted with divinity, with love from people who had never heard of Jesus, and then also having to reckon with the beliefs that I had been taught growing up that for some reason, because they didn't know Jesus, all of these people were going to go to hell. I couldn't, that didn't sit right with me. Um, and from there, it was also traveling to Cuba while studying in my PhD program and learning about Cuba from Cuba and not through the lens of the United States. And it, these experiences just, they opened me up in a way that made me very curious and want to learn more about what I didn't know. So. Thanks. Thanks for that. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I have I have had a number of like revelatory moments in my life where I where something like shakes me to my core and then I find myself sort of shifting and changing course fundamentally often. Um, I haven't had one of those in a little while, though COVID was something like that, but I'm still processing. Um, but I think one major one that I, I keep coming back to um, was, and I think this is related to, you know, how we are shaped by our environment, right, and by where we live, when we live, not just the family we grew up in, but also the, the broader political economic context. And I was 18 um, when 9-11 happened, and uh, I'd grown up in in the church and kind of evangelical, in an evangelical context and, you know, where we read the Bible and I knew about God's love and I grew up in a loving home and, um, you know, a home that said, you know, my parents taught me to, to love people, to love all people. Uh, and I was absolutely shocked by how many Christians responded to 9-11 in the United States by wanting 
to kill other people. And so that support, the support that people had for that war, the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq, I thought was totally antithetical to the gospel that I had learned, which was about love of enemy and the othering that took place, the othering of Muslims, the, the fear-mongering, and then the bombing started. And um, for me, that was, that shook me to my core, this radical disjunction between what I thought I had learned growing up about love and God's love versus what I was now seeing. And uh, that stayed with me all my life. It, it, it meant a shift in terms of um, where I went to church. At that time, I left the church altogether. I didn't want a, any part of the church. And then I ended up finding myself in the Mennonite church. And the reason was is because I felt like I could, here was a home where for me and um, that remains central I think to that kind of disjunction between what's confessed versus what's lived I'm always wrestling with that and, and, and I want to stay close to the absurdity of that feeling that I had like what? No I'm not going to live that way I don't think we should live that way that's not what God calls us to I always try to stay close to that because you know we can start growing accustomed to the world and um, so, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, I also have a couple moments. For me, um, one of the bigger, most recent ones, I think was a bigger change. Um, I was a student at the University of Northwestern, St. Paul. Um, and when the Black Lives Matter movement first started, I was like, I gotta see what's going on here. Um, and it was the first time that I realized a couple things. One, that people were projecting whatever race upon me that they felt most comfortable. Um, so when I was at Northwestern, um, predominantly white school, a lot of white people projected a white personality on me. Um, a lot of black people weren't sure <laughs> where I was, so I would get a lot of testing here and there, like, which side do you want, girl? Um, and that was really the first time where I was like, oh, okay, I feel other. Um, and in that, in that feeling, I became incredibly frustrated and I wanted to leave the school and I had a conversation with my mom. And I was like, a sophomore in college, I was like, I don't wanna go here anymore. Mom, I'm, I'm thinking about transferring schools. Um, and she was you know, frustrated and she brought up a lot of the, uh, well, okay, how much money are we paying to go here, all this stuff. And I was like, okay, mom, first of all, I'm paying for it, so I feel like I get to decide. But um, <laughs> she brought up a good point in saying, you know, Felicia, maybe, you know, maybe the Lord put you here because you kind of stand in the gap, maybe you have an opportunity here. Um, and that was a big shift for me, where I kind of realized like, I am, I am biracial and uniquely created, like almost as a physical representation of literally standing in the gap between black and white and this conflict. Um, and feeling like the Lord really called me into um, mediation and reconciling and became incredibly passionate about um, racial reconciliation from that point and from the Lord's perspective. and. Uh, when I thought about that, I thought about this, this song um, from like, I don't know, like middle school. It was like, the bridge is like, break my heart for what breaks yours. And I was thinking about like, how I used to sing that all the time. I'm like, wow, be careful what you worship with because like the Lord will give it to you. <laughs> and so from there, it's like teaching myself, how do I have grace and compassion for both of these sides that are incredibly upset and very staunch in their beliefs um, about each other and how do I bring those together, not only between my family members, but also between myself, these two warring sides of like, I grew up with both of these cultures, how do I do this? Um, and that just challenged like the entire concept of like love and what that means. Cause it's easy to be like, oh yeah, love people when you disagree with them or love people when they make you really angry when they're really annoying. So easy to say that when you're confronted with the reality of that, um, in your own family and in your day-to-day -day life in between the two sides of yourself, it's, it's incredibly difficult and you have the choice to either do the work um, and move forward or, or not and just kind of sit there in it and let it eat you. Um, so 
I chose to do the work and it was hard. It's still hard, um, but that was a big, my biggest changing point, I think. I wanna come back to that in a minute after Sarah <laughs> answers. We're gonna talk about what it means to do that work. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, what a powerful invitation to like go into our own stories and think about those moments, because I too have, have some moments. Um, the ones that popped to mind, though, in first thinking about this, uh, the one was an experience that I had before my sophomore year of college uh, that sat with me, and it was only years later that like the discomfort kind of being, what's, what's disrupted in myself, like I didn't know what to do with it for years. But it was that um, at the time there were um, there was a nationwide movement around in the particular evangelical church to work to get states to codify marriage as being just between a man and a woman. And um, I had grown up not like I grew up inside of uh, white evangelicalism, and um, I remember like sort of as a kid in the late 80s, hearing about AIDS and something about like bad, but I didn't like know what that meant really. And I had a friend in high school who got made fun of for being gay. Um, but then it, it all of a sudden became a thing, like being gay is against Jesus. And I was like, well, like, I love Jesus, and like, Jesus wants to heal all of us, so I should like figure this out. Because my initial impulse was like, uh, this doesn't make sense. If like Jesus loves everybody, I don't really get what's going on, but I should figure it out, right? Like, I care about the Bible. So I go to this conference hosted by Focus on the Family, um, which some of you know I spent a semester at Focus on the Family's Leadership Institute in college, and some of you didn't know that. Um, and it was called Love One Out. And it was about um, kind of fleshing out why God's vision for humanity was that um, people should, I, I, like brokenness made people gay basically was the theme. Um, and I remember I'm like going there and I'm praying and I'm like, Jesus, I just want to love everybody. And then there's people standing outside with signs and that say hate isn't a family value. And I just remember this profound cognitive dissonance. Because I'm like, I'm here because I want to love people and love Jesus and all the things. And then, but folks are like outside telling me that I'm not being loving. And that sat with me for years. Okay. The second thing I would say is that um, for me, it was starting seminary at Bethel, which I thought was the bastion of liberal, liberal heresy. Um, for those of you who don't get that joke, most people would not label Bethel as the hotbed of liberal heresy, just so you know. Um, and I was in a, I was working real hard to be the right kind of Christian, and I was failing miserably because I came in a body that was the wrong one to perfectly inhabit uh, orthodoxy. Namely, I should have been a white cisgender hetero male. Um, and I'm in class in spiritual formation, and all of a sudden I realized, like, Different, like maybe Methodists are Christians. <laughs> maybe some of my Lutheran friends, like there might just be different ways to understand God. And it will like began to blow me up in this like, like there could be space for me too. So I started going to therapy and like long story short, and that changed my life. And then the third thing that I'll say is um, I have always loved my country. And... Um, when Hurricane Katrina happened, and there were like Americans who were like stuck in a big dome, and I remember like being like, where's the Calvary? And I was like going to all the news and I couldn't find it. I'm like, how are there, 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 there's like people. And it like undid something in me where it opened me up to recognize that like, not everyone had the same experience of the police or of the laws in our country as I had had. It opened me up to listen in a new way. So I want to come back to what Felicia was talking about in terms of doing the work, right? And I think some folks in this room have some clues about the part of the work they want to do, which is to 
be more just and to shout to the rooftops that we love everyone and even to begin to put some action behind that. Right. And sometimes that comes with a shaming of the past versions of themselves and denigration of folks like who we used to be. So my question is, how do you do that part of the work? How do you embrace this different theological conviction that you now have and still embody a love that is allegedly for everyone, which would seem to include both past versions of yourself and then others who are like those versions? No, I, I mean, I'm happy for, I, I yeah. went to Felicia because she used the term reconciliation. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Guilty. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, okay, real life example. Um, so I talked about when the Black Lives Matter movement first started and I had shown up at the protest there, I got a lot of flack back from that, both from my family and also from uh, students I was going to school with. Um, interestingly enough, those same people, when uh, the George Floyd um, protest started happening, uh, those same people had now seen the light and they had made it and they understood now and they're, they're allies and they were really loud about it. Um, but the other thing that they were was incredibly impatient and um, just, just absolutely against everyone that had looked exactly like the way that they looked five years prior. Um, and so it was so interesting to me to, me to watch these people um, just get on the high horse and beat down other, other folks. Um, there was a lot of white people who would be in my inbox and be like, Felicia, like, oh my gosh, like, this must be so heavy for you. What can I do? Oh my gosh, I just heard the news. Um, and then those same people I would see either in real life or on social media, um, bashing other white people and saying like, you have no excuse, you, we have all these resources, you should have known this, like you don't have any excuse not to know, not to be there for these people. And it just struck me and I had to laugh because I'm like, those same resources were available to you five years ago when I had to deal with your ignorance and I was kind and compassionate to you because you didn't know. And those people don't know. And you, for whatever reason, have decided that because they are not on the same level of understanding as you, they are therefore wrong and therefore bad and therefore unlovable and unworthy of your time. Um, and so like that for me is, uh, yeah, how do you do that? How do you realize? I think um, it's interesting when you said, remember your ancestors earlier, I was thinking, yes, and also remember your past self and be grateful for the steps that you've taken to get to the present day. Um, and the people that look like your past version of yourself, it's like giving grace and understanding that you did the best you could with what you had in the time. Um, I find that often conversations that I have with people who are full of, of really passionate um, dislike or hate towards groups, it's, it's very much a lack of understanding. It's a lack of experience there. And many times when I encounter that, it, it actually breaks my heart. It doesn't make me like so angry. It's more just like, oh, you don't know. You have no idea. You've never had encounters with people. You don't, you don't love people from that side. You've never met them. You've never like given the chance. So I can't be angry at you because you don't know. I have to like provide opportunities for you to learn because I was provided opportunities to learn. And I, I couldn't have grown if somebody didn't offer me that compassion. Um, so I think it's very imperative to just remember to provide those opportunities for people rather than standing in a place of self-righteousness to just be humble and say, hey, I hear you, I see where you're at. Like, let's walk through this together. There's this concept in society right now where it's like either get right or like get out of the way. And as the church, we, we can't afford to do that. It's not get out of the way, it's okay, well, let's slow down, I'll stop. I'll stop, the rest of the movement can keep going, but I'll stop here, I'll sit with you. I'll sit with you until you're ready to walk with us. So I want to dig a little deeper here and bring, bring in the rest of you. Um, we talked this morning about the fear, right? The fear of making mistakes, the fear of doing the wrong thing, even unintentionally. This is kind of a two-part question. You know, do you think 
Jesus followers are called to do things differently than the secular justice activists? And how do we navigate this minefield of human difference? Building on what Felicia just said, I'd love to hear from the other three of you, whoever's willing. I'll speak to one part of that question, and then maybe the second part will come while I'm talking. Um, <laughs> we'll see. Um, <laughs> but I would, the thing that kind of bubbles up in me when you ask that question, Jeff, is that I actually have learned, for me, not to make a distinction between sacred and secular. I think there's a sacredness to all of life that shows up when I see someone who does not consider themselves to be Christian living and embodying God and love more than someone who claims that. Um, and the reason why that matters is because when we, you know, earlier I talked about how these cultures are produced and to kind of go back to the point that Felicia made, like we often don't know what we don't know, which is why it's easier for me to have grace for my previous self and other people who, and I have not arrived anywhere, but just understanding that like, you know, Rod made the point that we are formed in our environments. We are products of the cultures in which we inhabit. And so to expect someone to understand something that they've never been exposed to is just unfair. And so I, I guess as that dovetails into the part about Jesus followers and people who claim to be followers of Christ, um, yeah, I think we're called to embody the ideals and the teachings of Jesus because of what we ascribe to believe in and because of that, that allegiance. Um, I don't think it always happens that way. And I think that, that we can often learn a lot from, for, for example, justice activists who may not be Christian from the standpoint of just the way that they relate to the world. So I, I don't know how helpful that is, but I just, I wanted to put a pin in the distinction between sacred and secular, because I think oftentimes that can trip us up and help us and invite us not to recognize the sacred nature of what we sometimes consider to be secular. I appreciate that. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd second that. Um, caution to, to draw that distinction and also second the point about which I think is really a Matthew 25 point, which is that, you know, it's that, it's that part in, in Matthew when, um, right, you have the separation of the sheeps and the goats. My students get a little nervous about that. Uh, but the basic point is, right, and the, the, is that, you know, the question is, you know, um, you know, what, he, asked, he asked the disciples, like, well, why, why, um, uh, you know, as, 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 as much as you visited someone in prison or given someone food to drink or, or sorry, food to eat, water to drink, you know, um, what is it, clothing, um, then you visited me, right? And then the separation happens and they're like, wait, wait, you know, so... It, you know that we so it's not enough to say Lord Lord right it's not enough to confess Christ right it's in it's in the action right and it's what you do and often what we do is kind of contradicted by what we think something I'm learning a lot about it's like we think one thing but we do another some of the most um, radical people in my congregation were the people with the most conservative views in terms of what they thought, you know, how they talked about things, but in terms of how they acted. You know, they would show up, they would be present, you know, when there was a need, when there was an injustice, they would be there um, to, to work for, for, for justice. Um, the other point I want to make is, is a point about that I've learned from community organizing. So I've been com a community organizer of a sort uh, for about 10 years now. And um, one thing you learn pretty early on in community organizing is that you don't um, get people to your side uh, by yelling at them and screaming at them and telling them what they think is wrong. Um, 
Instead, it's more about building relationships, meeting people where they're at, uh, hearing each other's stories, and also learning to see that the enemy is not the other person before you, but the enemy is really systems and structures, powers and principalities, what Paul called the powers and principalities that you know, we are very much shaped by and affected by. And so, I don't know, I, I think about the, you know, my work is with undocumented people, and the organization I'm a part of is called Pueblos de Lucha y Esperanza, which is on my mug, Peoples of Struggle and Hope. And, you know, we try to meet people where they're at by talking about our shared struggles and our shared hopes. And part of what you learn pretty quickly is that we have a lot of shared struggles and hopes, and we have a lot of common dreams to be able to live freely, without the threat of deportation, like to be able to live with our families and to be able to have a dignified life, um, you know, to be able to play at the park, to go to school. I mean, all these things, there's a lot of things we need as humans that are, we have in common, right? And so to have that kind of sense of a shared self-interest in, in creating that world, um, I think can be the place um, where relationships of solidarity can be built and, um, yeah, so I think I'll end it there. So I'm thinking about resurrection because a lot of the things we're talking about right now are a renewal, a coming back to life, a rediscovery of bonds between people, right? And Sarah, um, when we were prepping, we and then this morning, yep. I'm just slapping this <laughs> thing like a little child. Um, <laughs> Welcome to my world. Um, this morning you spoke, just briefly, you hinted at the power of the resurrection in your life, right? And I would love to hear a little more about that. Um, help us understand what you've seen and what you continue to see in terms of the evidence of resurrection and how you cultivate that sense of resurrection. Ready? No, I'm just kidding. Um, thanks for that. Um, so in conversation with that, with um, some echo of translation, um, one of the things for me growing up in, in my family, um, and I think just how I learned in the middle of my own attachment style that I developed and my strategies for surviving the world, which we all do, um, I thought if maybe I was just a little bit better or a little bit smarter or a little bit something more, like my dad would come back, my mom would finally be okay, right? And as I like emerged as a person who was born as, with a female sex, I thought maybe if I just loved Jesus a little bit more, or like convinced you I did anyway, right? Or like, um, I mean, it was true, but like maybe you just didn't understand. <laughs> like you'd see me, you know? Because I really resonate, like learning is important. And like not shaming, because we're all human and we're all in process, and absolutely. And like, what do you do though within heterosexual relationships? Like domestic violence has been a thing, and I'm pretty sure that they know each other. So I had this impulse where I was like, I took on the, like, if I could just be the best female seminary student ever, then maybe my male colleagues would see me, you know? And I felt that impulse <laughs> in my pastoring sometimes in the midst of our own struggles. We're like, maybe there's a magical solution here. <laughs> and then everyone will be like, yes. Jesus, name change, gospel, goodness, amen, we're all in it together. And so it like trips up my own grief and the part of me that's wounded around like wishing I could fix and heal and save everything <laughs> and feeling grief when I can't. So to resurrection. Um, there's just like a lot of stuff in my life that like and I get it. I want to have compassion towards my younger self about, like, she brought me here. 
like all of the past younger selves we all carry, like they did the best they could. <laughs> you know, yay, sweetie. Um, that's also my like Holy Spirit speaking with like self-compassion and loving kindness sort of thing as God says sweetie because my inner voice doesn't usually speak that nicely. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I think with that, as, as I've let myself, and sometimes I've been, uh, my hands have been opened for me that I wouldn't have chosen them to be open that way, right? As I've been open to love and God's love in new ways have gone now to, I'm looking at one of the therapists in the room, therapy for like 17 years. Um, I found in my own story, like as I go into those places of grief, of terror, of longing, of shame, of whatever, the things that I'm sure will kill me, right? Because even the, you're talking about the performative whiteness. When you wake up and you're like, oh my gosh, like I'm a participant in like super bad stuff. Like, yes, <laughs> no, that's not me, I'm totally fine. <laughs> you know, like, that's what I do on the inside anyway. None of you, you all are cooler. But, um, as I actually go there and let myself need a savior to like bring me back to life, right? I've gotten to experience resurrection. Like the kid who never felt that they were loved feels love in her body now, like, right? So that's like this resurrection stuff of like us remembering becoming human again, and like, I'm like, that's good news. <laughs> like, this seems really good news. Let Jesus heal and save and love us. Oh, man. Um, and maybe just one last thing on that. Okay, so I'm partnered with this really lovely human named Andy Garbers. Uh, on our second date, Andy said to me, so you're a feminist, that means you hate men, right? Um, just candidly, some of you know, we were making out right before that, and I was like, clearly I hate you. Um, you know, <laughs> come on, man. Um, but what's been so beautiful to see is um, I actually asked Andy when we were first dating, I said, I want you to go home and I want you to look in the mirror and come up with a hundred things about you that are wonderful. Andy got to four. Um, and as Andy's done his own work of becoming human, Andy just this last year was and gone to therapy and done some stuff. He's like, I think I might even have over a hundred. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, I couldn't be partnered with a better person. So that's resurrection. Thanks. Um, I want to approach resurrection from a different, slightly different standpoint because Felicia wasn't able to be with us this morning because she was working with the kids. And this morning, some of you put some version of your hope for the church being more people, <laughs> new people, which is interesting. It's always an interesting thing to see growth as a marker of success, right? Um, but Felicia, you weren't here for our conversation about what we hope the church will be. Yeah. And you're in an interesting position of, as you told me, not having a church home. At risk of making you a target. <laughs> what do you hope the church will be? What is the spiritual home that you are craving? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I guess I've tried a lot of churches. Um, I lead worship in a lot of places, um, and I go a lot of places and work with a lot of people. Um, so I've seen a lot of things <laughs> in my 28 years of life. So um, <laughs> I think I think what I've been looking for is, um, I guess. Well, to say it bluntly, I'm looking for a church that kind of puts their money where their mouth is, I guess. Um, a lot of times when I encounter churches and I'm like, okay, great, this, this, is, this is good. Uh, what they say about what they believe, I, I too believe that. Um, but then when I watch them walk out that thing that they say that they believe, it's 
doesn't quite look like what they say. Um, so kind of opposite. I mean, it is like what you were saying, how you know we think one thing and then we do another thing, but it's like they were doing the opposite of it, the same thing, but the opposite of like, yeah, we think this good thing, but we're doing this not great. We're not executing it well. Um, I would love to see um, a congregation that has people with like vastly different um, lifestyles being able to be under the same roof. I want to see a congregation where when the outside world looks at it, they go, that doesn't make any sense. Um, because when I look at the disciples of Jesus, I'm like, well, there's no reason that these people should have got along. Like, there's no reason that these people other than encountering Christ should be spending time together. They wouldn't. In fact, like there's a lot of them Matthew, um, nobody would be like, I'm not going to touch you with that a 10 foot pole. I don't even want to be seen with you. I don't want to be associated with you. So I want to be, I want to find a congregation that um, has somebody walk in with a, a Planned Parenthood t-shirt and says, you are welcome here. And then the very next person that walks in has a MAGA hat on. They say, you are welcome here to encounter people exactly where they are in their process and not to expect them to be somewhere that they cannot be without growth. Um, I just haven't encountered a lot of congregations like that. And even like saying those like very extreme opposites, like I saw some uncomfortable shifting. You know what I mean? Where it's just like, ooh, I don't, I don't agree with that person at all. I don't want them in my congregation kind of thing. It's not something that we would actively say out loud, especially as Minnesotans. We would think it to ourselves. Um, but it's, it's very much a felt thing. And I just haven't. I haven't encountered that yet. And the most at home I felt in a church place is when I'm just hanging out with believers outside of a church building without a system, I guess. And we're just encountering people naturally making relationships and connections. And then they're like, hey, I've never met a Christian like you. What's up with that? Um, so I guess I'd, I'd like to see a church congregation like that. Thanks for sharing that. Um, the last question I have for you before uh, we open things up for these folks to ask a question of you, I'd love for each of you to answer this. Um, Felicia, you just mentioned discomfort. Sarah, you're talking about like all these things that are crying out for healing, right? And this journey you've been on. Um, and then I talked for a while about love. And I think there's an intersection there. And I'd love for each of you to help us see the intersection in your own lives, how does each of you cultivate your own sense of belovedness? Uh, again, some folks have heard me name this, but um, when our first foray into changing our name failed, um, I felt a lot of grief and part of how I like have learned to respond is I'll amp up, like I'll armor up and, and, uh, this song kept coming in my head again and again, give me doubt, give me doubt so I can love my neighbor as myself. And so, um, give me doubt so I can lay all my weapons on the ground when the armor of God is too heavy for peace, give me doubt. And I think for me, part of the journey of love is like letting myself be vulnerable um, like being real about my own griefs and longings and hopes and dreams and being tender enough to like just name it um, and then in that because it's like my way of trusting myself to the world and so then part of that has also been letting myself be loved by actual humans. Because I, I probably appeared vulnerable because I'm an extrovert, so I can, like, say whatever, you know, my whole life. But I actually, like, here's the tender thing, you know? So, like, with Jonah dying and Christians and them grieving, like, I realized it was probably the first time in my life that I had actually let other people really help me. And I was so happy. <laughs> I was like, look at this growth. <laughs> Where, you know, because I profess love, but like to really surrender. Um, so being vulnerable. And that's my, that's my thing. I'm learning. 
Thank you. <laughs> um, I would echo that vulnerability is so important. Um, one of the ways that I personally do that is I purposely surround myself with people who we all have extremely, extremely different opinions. Um, and the reason I do that is to make sure that I don't fall too deeply into one perspective and so wholeheartedly that I can't see another person's perspective. Um, it's incredibly vulnerable because it requires me to be able to say that I made a mistake and to have those people call me out and say, um, this is not right, um, which kind of sucks, <laughs> um, if I'm being honest, but also like, I don't really see an alternative way to live because if I if I can't see from other perspectives, then I can't love other people well. Um, and so that to me is really important um, because it allows me to have grace and compassion for others and in doing so having grace and compassion for myself. Um, I always think about like loving uh, others as Christ loves you and also loving yourself as Christ loves you, which we like say that a lot because it's you know a very Christian thing to say. We all know it. But also, um, hi, Jesus literally died. Um, and so like thinking about putting your life on the line for some other people or putting the life, like metaphorically putting the life on the line for yourself, like that kind of extreme, radical, nothing is in my way kind of love. Um, that's what I aim for when I'm surrounding myself with people with different perspectives so that I remain open to critique so that I can love better. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm not so good at this um, cultivation. Um, I have to be reminded by others, I think, a lot. I think um, I have a great mom and a great dad, so I can always call them. Um, and I'm someone who, who has wrestled a lot, and I guess I'm being vulnerable right now, but with um, these contradictions that I was talking about, when, like when I say like I have this revelation or I feel this contradiction between how I think, you know, what love should look like and seeing such hatred or violence, like that, um, that, can, that, that, that can really break me. Mm. And um, sometimes that's been really great because that has led to some cool things. When I was a pastor, you know, we did a lot of work with undocumented people and um, including an action that solidarity with the caravan from Central America. And, um, you know, as a pastor, you have people around that can, you can, that to support you in that work and to kind of live some of those things out, you can lead from that place. But as we know too, when, you know, in ministry, it can really burn you out. Um, and, um, yeah, what am I trying to say? I guess what I'm trying to say is that there are times where I feel like if I don't act on an injustice or when I see some form of violence happen, if I don't do something about it, that it's hard for me to know how to go on living. Um, and that's a real struggle for me. Um, but I just think of one time, it was after one of the many uh, police shootings here in the Twin Cities over the last few years since George Floyd. And I was teaching and I taught at St. Thomas and, and I would teach black theology and, and, and liberation theology and this was, well, this was happening, right? So I canceled class and I was like, hey, we, we're gonna need a break, you know? And I was so, um, so sad, I was totally broken. And my, my daughter, Elida, you know, went for a walk with me and we went walking and it was um, around this time of year, it was starting, you know, the, starting to see some growth on the, on the trees. Hopefully we're going to see it more soon. Uh, but it was actually kind of a cloudy day like this and um, we're walking and, 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 and she, and I would share with her what's going on with me and, and what I'm feeling and what, what happened recently. And, and then she'd, say, she'd just sort of say, Dad, look at the ground. Like, look at the flowers growing. And I would just be like, what? What are you talking about? You're not listening to me? <laughs> it's like, oh, wow. And then we kept walking. We went to the park, and, and she's like, do uh, you want to go up on the hill with me? And it was kind of like, like, really, it was this time it was muddy. I don't, I don't know. I don't, honey, I don't want to go up on the, the hill. 
She's like, come up on the hill with me. I think you'll like it. Oh, fine, I'll go up on the hill. I go up on the hill, and she starts explaining this whole world to me about, she's like, when we go out to the park, this is where, you know, this is the water, this is the sea, this is, you know, this is, this is Wendy's house, this is Owen's house, like the, this whole kind of world that, that she lives within. And, and a whole new world opened up to me, and I started to see the world differently. And, and I realized, you know, she was probably trying to, I don't know, she was doing something. Uh, whether she knew it or not, but it was like I began to see joy again. I began to see life again, you know. So I I, I struggle to find that, and um, so you know, paying attention to the birds, paying attention to flowers, paying attention to beauty and on the earth, and the and the ordinary beauty beauties um, matters a lot. And and sometimes that ha that, hap that happens a lot with children. And we have a lot to learn from children. Jesus knew this, of course preaches about it, but I, we, we forget so much uh, that, that that curiosity, right? We, I, I've learned so much from my kids. So, and also I make pizza. I recommend that, baking pizza, working with dough. Um, there's a lot to learn there. What comes to my mind <clears throat> is being willing to cling to our connectedness is something that um, I'm, I'm learning um, as someone who's been socialized through the, you know, masculinity and especially a black man in the United States to be impenetrable, to be hard be for the sake of whatever it might be. And Sarah, when you said vulnerability, that's the word that was coming to my mind when he asked this question, because there's a deep human healing strength in being vulnerable but being vulnerable knowing that we are connected. Mm -hmm. And so when you are able to allow yourself to be vulnerable with people like your daughter or people like my kids or my wife or f close friends, people that I consider soulmates of all different types, um, and that gets returned to you cared for and not harmed, that is a way that I learn my own belovedness. It, I don't, you can't learn it by yourself because we don't exist alone. So it's a scary and yet powerful thing to be vulnerable, but that is, I think, where our human strength comes from. So. We've got about 10 minutes for you to test these folks and get even more beautiful answers. Any questions? I don't really have a question. I have a comment and all transparency. <laughs> um, one thing I personally feel the church in general is lacking is viewing the fracturedness from a perspective of hope. I crave that for myself. I see that in my kids, um, especially the younger generations not having a lot of history and experiences of seeing um, resurrection in their own lives and how resurrection can play a part in all of the very difficult situations that we're confronted with every day. Um, I just feel like applying the hope of resurrection to everything um, is something that we could focus in on so much more instead of being caught in the element of the moment that can get depressing or distracting, uh, loss of hope, whatever. It feels like the resurrection story can really soften the lines between people's differences. And I would really desire for the church overall to figure out a way to apply that story in a more generic way and touch people with that. Because I think when you've lived a number of years, your ability to look in your rearview mirror and see how God has come forward and to you in those difficult times is never evident in the moment, but it is evident in your story that you've lived. And I would really love to see the church focus more on hope. And to me, hope stands for having our perspectives enlarged.
Hi, I'm Kirsten. Woo! Live. Um, is it Felicia? Yeah. Uh, you spoke about sitting, oh, maybe I'm, uh, okay, my interpretation, what I heard you say, sure. was sitting on the side of the road with folks who need to um, take a moment to reflect or take a long time to reflect. Yep. And who are, um, and also, I'm a pastor trying to build a community like what you described, where people are allowed to be in very different places. Uh, this is not a recruiting call. You aren't going to come all the way up to where I live. Um, what I'm struggling live? with, what? <laughs> so where do you live? I'll tell you later. All right. Um, <laughs> what I'm struggling with dearly is that there are, there is, there seems to be, and I recognize my own um, barriers could be getting in the way of what I'm seeing, but there seems to be very little interest in being part of the community where everyone can be accepted from those folks who, um, who need to sit by the side of the road for a while. And so when I attempt to sit with them, I feel rejected. Mm -hmm. not, not that my feelings are the problem, more like I'm just like, well, I, you don't want me here. So how much do I keep trying to do this or how much am I just getting stuck in the mud now instead of being able to continue on the walk where I feel called to go? Yeah. And not just as pastor, but as uh, leading, uh, not just as me as an individual, but as pastor leading the community where I feel they need to go. So how, I just want some reflection if you guys are willing to do that. And that is a really, mm, in red parts of this state, a real challenge to figure, and probably lots of other places too, to figure out how to create a community where those people who would like <laughs> me to never, ever, ever talk about politics at all because that's divisive, mm -hmm. to be part of my community. That's the way I'll describe it. I have tried so hard to say, your voice is welcome here too. Here's what I hear Jesus saying. Do you hear something different in what Jesus is saying? Now that's scary because it's coming from a person who has a degree, right? And you don't want to take on the pastor with that stuff. But how do we even enter into the conversation and try to create that space? It feels like a, um, a place where I could get so stuck that I won't ever move forward. And that's not good either. So I I'm, I'm, would love some reflection on that from you guys. Yeah, uh, I'm smiling really big if you guys saw because uh, when I was working with the kids this morning, I had a kiddo ask the exact same question. Yes, yeah, so we were talking about lights. We were doing this thing with uh, tea candles, and I was saying how Jesus has given every single person a light. That light may or Hello, okay. <laughs> that light may or may not be on. Um, that light representing hope, faith, love. Um, and if you have a light, how do you get the other person's light to come on? Um, and one of the kids said, well, what if, what if they don't want you, what if they don't want you to light their light? How do you, what do you do with that? Um, so I love that you asked that question <laughs> because the kiddos are wondering the same thing. Um, one of the kids, he said, uh, you know, you could just try again or you could wait because they know that you have a light and when they want their light to be lit, they know where to find it. Um, yes, guys, you got great kids. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So, so what I would say truly, sometimes, sometimes uh, our differences on what we hear Jesus saying to us um, can't come first in those types of conversations. Sometimes it's the relationship and the connection that has to come before you dive deep into those, how do we differ theologically conversations? Because it's very easy to remove yourself emotionally and become very um, lawyeristic with those and say, here are my facts, here's what I understand from my perspective. It's so easy to do that, right? Because it's not vulnerable. You're just presenting things that you know. Um, it becomes vulnerable when you have a deep connection with that person, and that is built in other ways. Um, and so that part, I would say, comes first. If you're gonna sit down with somebody on the side of the road, um, it's less helpful to discuss heady things and more like, hey, do you need some water? Are you hungry? You know, um, 
there's other needs that we can meet to build and establish connection and vulnerability before we get to the theological differences. And they'll come to you eventually. They know where the light is. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, <clears throat> uh, a couple things. I, I before mentioned that, is your chair hating on you? Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> By the way, when I say I'm sorry, it's not because I thought I did it, but it's just a feel for you. That's not fun. Um, uh, so a couple things. One is I had mentioned before my own growth in codependency and intersecting with my faith and the remembrance that I'm not Jesus and that's not my work. Um, and we talked about a really tangible example that we experienced at Meeting House Church recently around our name change. So I think one of my own um, wrestlings or learnings from that is, uh, and also as an ethicist, I have to respect that each of you are your own grown-ups. Like you're your own selves, you're on your own journey, right? Just like I am. So it's not my job and it's profoundly disrespectful to the humanity of the other person. I've had to tell myself this to learn. Um, to think that I can help save or fix anybody or that that's my job because it's actually me just not wanting to deal with the fact that I think I failed and I'm afraid and all sorts of other things, right? So my job is to tend to my own light and to proclaim and to seek out the beauty and the goodness that I believe like God's been birthing within me and within that. To always like be checking myself of where am I grounded I, uh, there's, um, and one of, in Strength to Love by MLK, he has this line in one of the things, which one of y'all might know which actual one, where he talks about, like, it's basically like the MLK interpretation of um, A Midsummer Night's Dream, Take My Hand If We Be Friends. He's, like, basically, like, hey, white brothers, like, am I really open to you becoming human with me? And I think even through the name change process in our community, in the midst of the grief or the pain of, like, do I, am I grounded in love? Because we all know when we're not loved. You know, when I'm just condescendingly like, oh, you're, I'm so much smarter than you kind of thing. And so I think it's, for me, both the like, my, what is my job? My job's to be rooted and grounded in the truth that God has been birthing in me up until this might, might be wrong, but I'm just saying, at least I'm trying, you know, to shine my light. And, and then to honor wherever the person's at their journey and then keep checking myself of, is there love that pulsates here? And the reality is, is that some folks needed to say, I can't be in community with you right now, Sarah. And like many of you, I'm never gonna actually get over that. Like, I grieve that. And I, I keep checking myself to say it's not like, oh, you, you left. <laughs> Good riddance. Because I don't feel that. I'm actually, like, sad and hurt. <laughs> um, but that at some point, if that person ever wants to turn back and say, hey, like, would you sit with me? Or, like, Sarah, you hurt me. Like, man, I'd love that day. So I think that's just that's some of how... But also, can I just, I, I hear you, <laughs> I feel you. Uh, I'm sorry, I just took up all the minutes. Um, <laughs> do you want this one to go over, or should I go over? Jeff, we've got one more here. Do you want to go over? Do one more? It's up to you, I'd say do one more. Okay. We're going to do one more, and then we'll wrap. So get just a couple minutes. If you need to run, though, you we're not offended. We're grounded. Well, in this love. is a question for about the whole day it, yeah. for Jeff and and the panel. Um, at I the, all day, this has been such a wonderful experience. I have not heard the word evil once today, and yet when you talk about loving your enemies and steadfast love, I think if there are some very evil people in the world like Putin who have killed millions of others. If he were sitting in the pew, I'm not capable of loving him. Um, so my question is, where does evil fit into steadfast love?
The Mennonite will go first. No, really, I meant what I said, I guess, with regard to systems and structures and not human beings. I mean, I, I actually really do believe that. I believe that, you know, that, that Paul was right about powers and principalities in terms of being possessed in certain kinds of ways. So I don't believe that people are evil. I believe that people can become possessed uh, by systems and structures that are violent, by ideologies that that justify further violence. And I don't think that any of us are free from that. Um, so I think the focus needs to be on changing the systems and structures that, that kill. Um, and I think the question for us is, you know, I mean, we're, we don't, I mean, we, there are any number of ways, I guess, that we could sort of act in relation to, let's say, Putin or given your example, right? What are those ways that we can act creatively, right, to care for those who, who suffer under, under that violence, right? Or to, like, there are creative ways that we can do from, from the ground up, right, uh, given where we are, given that we're not in the halls of power in the same kind of way. But yeah, I would, I would put the emphasis on systems and structures and less on people and try to see the beauty in people and the possibilities that, um, that um, yeah, the, possi the, the possibility that they're loved too, even Putin is loved, and that we're called to, to, show, to show love in some kind of way. But that love can be fierce and militant love, as I said before. I guess resistance, I do believe in that, is the heart of the, of the faith, resistance against the powers of evil. But I think we we're in danger if we start identifying people with evil. I think that's when we get into trouble, rather than systems and structures. Yeah. I appreciate that reflection, Ryan. I, I just would piggyback on it, um, <clears throat> maybe bring it closer to home. Uh, I think racism is evil, and at the same time, I recognize that it lives really as a kind of residual conspiracy that we participate in collectively. So to your point of about people, you know, you can't find an evil genius for white supremacy. It's something that is collectively reproduced, and yet it is evil. Reproduced by people who are well-intentioned, genuinely good people, and yet perpetuating something that is evil. Um, and so that separation, I think, is critical. Um, and it shares the responsibility, of, it disperses the responsibility among us to say, okay, if this, is an, if this is a system that we are sometimes blindly reproducing, then it's incumbent upon all of us to figure out what our role is in relation to this production and to creatively produce something different. Yeah, let me be the last one to speak on this since I'm the one who brought up the whole steadfast love thing to begin with. Um, I did use the word sin. I did use the word sin. And I think sin is real. Not all of our lives are touched by sin. I also believe in prayer. Prayer is not popular, partly the fault of politicians who trot out thoughts and prayers mindlessly, without action. But especially when we're talking about uh, suffering on the level of centuries, if not millennia, of racism, and imperialism like we're seeing out of Putin, I think prayer matters. I think prayer matters not just to summon forces that are beyond us, because sometimes things really are beyond us, but also to keep us human. Because part of the prayer can be that you would see that Putin is God's beloved, and that you would hope for a better future for him, one in which he is healed so that he doesn't have to hurt people anymore, one in which all of us can be healed so none of us will hurt people anymore. Because we are all interconnected. We are all interdependent. We are not autonomous beings. 
So that's where I see God's steadfast love at work, slowly knitting us back together when we constantly try to tear each other apart. Uh, again, major thanks to all of you as our panelists. Jeff, thank you for being here with us today. Uh, to all those who volunteered to make this happen, to our adult ed team, Jenny, all of you, thank you so much. And to y'all for being here, being willing to spend your Saturday leaning in to listen and wrestle with one another. Um, let's, uh, uh, a couple things then. Jenny, do you want to come up and say about that? Uh, tomorrow morning, we invite you back. We have one worship service that we're going to collectively gather for. Jeff's going to be preaching a little bit. I think about love <laughs> some more. Yay. <laughs> um, so that's going to happen. Um, and then, Jenny, wh wh why don't you tell folks what they had in their packet, and then I'll send you out with a blessing. Perfect. So if you want to bring out your packets, you all have a little rectangular card here. And I want to tell you about that and kind of merge in everything we've done today and send you out with an intention. What these are, today is Earth Day, for those who don't know. Yay. Earth. Yay. <laughs> so we were very consciously, uh, Haley and I especially, really worked together. The majority of our conference materials are sustainable, uh, very eco-friendly. What these are, these are plantable seed cards for wild native flowers. So here is your opportunity. On the back, Christian and I came up with a question we want to send you with. What would it look like to plant the small seeds of God's love, justice, and peace in your community and or neighborhood? What I want to bring in that Jeff has said, if one of those seeds means planting that love that God extends to yourself within yourself, and that is a way of planting a seed to be able to go out into your community, start with that. And one of the reasons I led you in some of those breathing is so you can start to connect with this. And I encourage you to continue to be prayerful uh, and to stay connected with all of this. Go out with an intention. What is at least one seed you want to bring with you from today? to go out into our community, the world. I do want to acknowledge all of the people online because we have people from across the world with us online today. And so I would acknowledge we have an opportunity here to go out and be disciples of everything that Jeff and the panel has talked with us about today. So that is my encouragement and challenge to you all. Great. I'll take that, sure. Um, so with that, I wanted to send you with a, a little blessing. And we started with some Joy Harjo, and I'm going to end with some. Uh, Joy Harjo has a poem entitled Remember. Okay, And it, I think, echoes with this huge theme throughout the Hebrew scriptures, right, to remember. So might you remember your baptism, remember you are beloved. And here's the invitation to remember. Remember the sky that you were born under. Know each star's stories. Remember the moon. Know who she is. Remember the sun's birth at dawn that is the strongest point of time. Remember sundown and the giving away tonight. Remember your birth, how your mother struggled to give you form and breath. You are evidence of her life and her mother's and hers. Remember your father. He is your life also. Remember the earth whose skin you are. Red earth, black earth, yellow earth, white earth, brown earth. We are earth. Remember the plants, trees, animal life who have all of their tribes and families and history too. Talk to them. Listen to them. They are alive poems. Remember the wind. Remember her voice. She knows the origin of this universe. Remember, you are all people, and all people are you. Remember, you are this universe, and this universe is you. Remember, 
All is in motion, is growing, is you. Remember, language comes from this. Remember, the dance language is that life is. Remember. May you remember the love of the God who calls you beloved. Amen.